Hey, good morning. Courtney does a great job, doesn't she? Give her another round of applause. It's been fun to watch her grow and, and mature in, in the leadership role here at Park Cities. It's been cool to see. Um, in fifth grade, that's an awkward transition, but there we go. Um, in fifth grade, uh, not much older uh, than these, these kiddos that were up here earlier, uh, I developed a crush on a young little girl named Megan Smith, a little blonde-haired girl named Megan Smith. And I had this crush for, for a couple months, and I finally decided it's time to do something about it. I'm going to tell her how I feel. So I waited for the best opportunity I could, a Friday afternoon when everybody was going to the buses. Because like, if this goes south, I've got a whole weekend. She'll forget for two days before I see her again on Monday, right? So I waited until everybody was going to the buses, which was a terrible decision. Because it was like a third world open air market. Kids trying to get to buses, everybody's running around. So I distinctly remember being like, Megan. And she turned and looked at me and I said, I like you. <laughs> and to this day, seared into my memory, is the image of this horrified young girl <laughs> who didn't know what to do with this expression of affection from, uh, from another fifth grader. So uh, yeah, it was, it was not fun. Uh, that, was, that was a rejection. And rejection is something that I think all of us are afraid of, right? Nobody likes the feeling of rejection, no matter how old you are. It doesn't ever get easier to be rejected. If you go in for that job interview and, and they, they say, hey, you know what, we're going to go in a different direction, that, that hurts a little bit because you, you, you got up for it, you were ready, you thought you had a legitimate shot at it, and, and you wound up uh, not getting the job, or or asking somebody out on a date, and they're like, nah, I don't think I really want to see you ever again, or nor in that context. Rejection is difficult to deal with, but there are some things that we feel like are worth the risk of rejection. It's worth it to get cleaned up, to go to that job interview, because you might get the job of your dreams. It's worth it to get on one knee and ask that person to marry you because you're, you're hoping, and, and hopefully it's, it's more of a guarantee, uh, hopefully it's a formality at that point, uh, you're hoping that that person says yes, right? You're hoping for the life of happiness. So we weigh, we weigh the benefits, the advantages and the disadvantages of rejection versus acceptance, and we decide it's worth the risk. But I think one of the things that we choose not to say is worth the risk is opening our mouth about our faith saying the name of Jesus. Sometimes we think the, the, the chance of rejection here is just not worth the possibilities of what might happen. I might lose a friendship or I might make this person feel awkward. It's not worth the risk to say anything or do anything in that instance. So we're wrapping up the last of our series on this Jesus, where we're talking about who this Jesus is in this scripture rather than that Jesus, the Jesus that we kind of concoct in our own minds. And, and this week, what we're talking about is this Jesus is rejected. And what I want us to do today is to get our head around the fact that being rejected is part and parcel of being a Christian. It's a part of being a follower of Christ. Rejection is something that we will experience. And we're going to talk about why that is. We're going to be in Acts chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 5, and I want us to, to just kind of walk through easily through three things, uh, proclaiming, preparing, and praying. And the first thing we need to proclaim is that Jesus is Lord. Proclaim that Jesus is Lord. So as we've seen through the past few weeks, uh, the church is growing. It's expanding in these early days, and it's expanding rapidly. The church is growing, and people are preaching, people are coming to know the Lord, and great miracles are happening. And at one of these instances where the, the church is together, Peter and John are going up to the temple, and there is a, a man who hasn't been able to walk since he was a little boy. And Peter and John say, we don't have anything to give you, but we do have healing, go and be well. Well, this gets back to the religious leaders, and the religious leaders are like, no, you can't do that. You can't heal, 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 heal in the name of Jesus Christ. We're going to lock you in prison for a night, and then we're going to bring you to trial. So this is where we pick up the story in verse 5. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem. Now, this group is called the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was largely made up of a group of people called the Sadducees. The Sadducees were a religious faction that controlled the temple. They were fairly wealthy. They were connected a little bit with the, uh, with the Gentile rulers, and they did not believe in the resurrection which would explain why they're very antagonistic towards the disciples, because they're running around and saying, 
Jesus has been resurrected. And so you see some names here coming up that are going to be familiar. These are the same people that ordered the crucifixion of Jesus. Gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? They basically asked them, on what authority or by what supernatural power did you do this? And they're asking, they already know the answer, they're asking for it to be entered into legally into the record. They're trying to get them on on kind of a record that, the, that this is what's happened. Modern day equivalent of this would be, hey, what gives you the right to do this? What gives you the right to do this? And strangely enough, this is the same question that Jesus gets asked in Luke 20, verse two. Who gives you the authority to do this, to do the things you're doing, to teach the things you're teaching? And remember, Luke is the author, obviously, of the Gospel of Luke, but he's also the author of the book of Acts. And Peter responds, and he has two levels to his response. There's an explicit response, which is the words that actually come out of his mouth, and then there's an implicit response, kind of some underlying subtext that's not said, but is there that the Sanhedrin would have picked up on. So let's look at the explicit response. One, it's actually the words that he says. Look at verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, If we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, he's really tactful there, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. He answers their question directly and explicitly. We healed in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and you would know him, Because he's the guy that you ordered to be crucified not too long ago. Oh, and by the way, we know you don't believe in this, but he's been raised from the dead. It's a direct, explicit challenge. Peter's proclaiming Jesus as Lord, and he's doing it in a way that challenges both what they believe and what they have done. And it's a very succinct way of doing it. But there's another subtle layer as well. There's an underlying area. Look at verse 10 again. By him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now I'm going to stop right here real quick and take a little detour before we get back to the implicit part. Some of you in this room, and in a room this size, there's certainly going to be some people who don't understand the value of being rejected for the sake of Christ. And one of the reasons why you might not understand that is because you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You stand here today or you sit here today and you you stand under uh, what is considered to be uh, an alienation from God. You don't have a relationship with him. And so Peter's words today are for you. There is no other name under heaven that you can be saved by. It's not your good works. It's not coming to church. It's not being a nice person. All those things are great things. But when it comes to having a relationship with God, they will get you nowhere. It is only by putting your faith and trust in what Jesus Christ did. He lived the perfect life. He died on the cross. And he was raised to life. All of that, that's that's where you're putting your name. You're saying, I believe. I'm relying totally, wholly on that and not on anything else, to have a right relationship with God, to be accepted by God. And usually what we do in our services is we say, uh, I'll I'll talk for another 20 minutes, and then at the end I'll say, if you want to go talk to somebody about that, you can go talk to somebody. But the rest of this isn't going to make any sense for you if you are not a follower of Christ. So I want to give you the opportunity now. If you want to go talk to somebody, there is somebody waiting over there in the next steps area for you to talk to them right now. And my concern for you is that if you wait 20 minutes, you'll talk yourself out of it. You'll get hungry for lunch, and you'll say, I'm going. I'm not going to go talk to anybody. Go now. You have time. and Spend the rest of the time talking. But don't waste this opportunity to have a relationship with Christ. Don't waste this opportunity. So let's talk about the implicit responses here. There's a subtle comparison that Peter makes between the Sanhedrin and the church. Notice what he says. He says, this man stands before you well. And in the previous verse, what he said was, you guys crucified a man. So your group kills people, and our group makes people well and makes them better. Notice the difference. 
You people are, are merchants of death, and, and we, on the other hand, are bringing life to people. Jesus Christ is working through us. The Holy Spirit is working through us to bring life and healing. But there's a second subtlety. Notice in verse 11, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Peter quotes a psalm here. This is Psalm 118, verse 22. And the Sanhedrin would have known this psalm. They would have believed this psalm. They would have believed that this psalm is actually about Israel, the nation of Israel. That is the stone that the builders, and the builders would have been uh, the Gentile nations. That's the stone, those are the people that rejected the stone. But Peter's saying, no, 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 you've got it wrong. The stone that the builders rejected is Jesus, and you guys are the builders. And he becomes the cornerstone in the resurrection from the dead. And you might think, okay, well, that's cool. That's kind of like a direct sort of conversation. I like that. But the subtle part is this. Peter answers this question the exact same way that Jesus got answered the question in Luke 20, verse 2. When Jesus gets asked, by what authority have you done this? Jesus gives a fairly lengthy answer. And then he concludes his statement by quoting this psalm. And what this shows is that Peter, the early church, is lockstep with the original teachings of Jesus. There aren't, there's no break here. And so the Sanhedrin, again, were the people that asked this original question. So they would have known, wait, we've heard this before. Jesus taught this very thing. And Peter's saying, guys, you've heard this before. This isn't anything new. You heard this months ago. And here we are again, having the same conversation. And Peter proclaims the gospel directly, explicitly, and implicitly. And the way we live our lives proclaim things about who we are. We are constantly proclaiming something. I'm constantly making something known to the people around me. And there are things that come out of my mouth that I want you to believe, but there are things about my life maybe that are inconsistent with the way that I live my life. That's called hypocrisy, right? It's, a, it's, it's something the church gets bashed with a lot. We're a bunch of hip, hypocrites. The ways you see, see that show up in your own life is you say you go to church to worship, but really we're here to check a box. I say I care about my coworkers, but I look at them as obstacles and inconveniences to, inconveniences to getting my work done. I say we care about our friends, but we're really only there for the good times or when we can get something out of them. We're explicitly and implicitly proclaiming things out of our lives all the time. And we're commanded, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're commanded to proclaim Jesus Christ. Do you know what that means, to proclaim Christ? It doesn't mean jump up on your desk or your lunch table and just start yelling at people. That's awkward. If the Lord leads you to do it, go for it. But again, awkward. What it means is that we are constantly making him known. We're showing and telling people the world around us who is the source of life for us? Who is the source of joy for us? Where our hope is. And there's this great, great quote by St. Francis of Assisi, but by the way, it, it, he really didn't say it. Uh, it's attributed to him. And a lot of people love it. It's preach Christ always, and if necessary, use words, right? It's a great quote. What's happened, though, is we've manipulated it and said, preach Christ always, and really don't ever use words. Like, people are going to assume that you're sitting at a bar not drinking and they're going to figure out that Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected. I'm just going to assume you're pregnant. <laughs> Male or female, I'm going to assume you're pregnant. I'm going to assume that God has just done something or science has done something and, and you are a dude and you're pregnant and that's why you're not drinking. Because you're in a bar. People need to be explicitly told the gospel. Nobody figures out salvation by Christ crucified, buried, and resurrected. Nobody figures that out. You know what the New Testament calls that? Paul calls it a great mystery. You don't figure it out on your own. Now, a lifestyle helps. You need to have the implicit part too. You need to have the, the lifestyle to go with it. You need to have a lifestyle that's pursuing and following Christ. Not that it needs to be perfect. Not that it needs to be seminary trained. Not that it needs to know how to walk through the four spiritual laws. You just need to have a lifestyle that coincides with, I'm a sinner who've been saved by grace and has received forgiveness. And now I'm letting you know this great hope and joy and salvation that I have. And you can have it too. You need to have an explicit proclamation. That means you need to know what you believe. You need to be able to communicate the gospel. And I can't tell you how many conversations I have with people 
that say they're Christians but cannot explicitly tell me what they believe about Jesus Christ. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. I'm going to run through them again. The five things. Jesus was a man who's the son of God who lived. He was killed. He was resurrected. He forgives me for my sin. And now I have a relationship with God because of it. And you can too. That's what you need. Those are the five things that you need to say to somebody. That's what we believe. And if you want to know, if I'm, if I'm proclaiming the gospel, whether I'm using words or not, which I think you have to use both, how will you know if you're successful? How will you know if your message is getting through? The same way that Peter knew his message was getting through, it challenges the beliefs and the lifestyle of the people you're talking to. Remember, Peter's talking and he says, I know, basically says, you guys, I know you don't believe in the resurrection, but here you go. I know you killed Jesus, but this is the gospel. In the same way, when we speak to people, it should challenge them. Not in a rude way, not in a condescending way. Tone is so critical, so critical. But your people that you speak to should be asking questions. Your life looks like this. Why doesn't my life look like this? Your life looks like full of joy and hope. Or even when you're going through a difficult time, you still seem to be clinging to this faith. What you're going through would have wrecked me. Why, am I, why are you not wrecked? Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected. That's why I'm not wrecked. Because I believe is, my hope is in him. So if you want to know whether your message is getting through, ask yourself, are people being challenged by what I say? And odds are, if people aren't being challenged, you're probably not being explicit enough. Because a resurrected Jesus Christ challenges every single one of us. But there's also an implicit component, and I'm going to run through these real quick. We should be life givers. Remember how Peter makes the comparison between the church and the Sanhedrin. The church is life giving. As people, we should be people who give life. People should flourish when they're around us. But instead, we find ourselves focused on ambition, selfishness, our comfort, our conveniences. We're complainers. That's not life giving. I tend to complain myself, granted, but I do it in a fun way that's kind of cute. But people complain, that's not life-giving. It's not life-giving. Be a source of joy, of hope. Not, not unfounded optimism, but joy and hope. Be, be a presence that heals, if not spiritually. Be somebody that heals emotionally and spiritually. Be the person that people seek out at your job or in your friend group. to Be like, man, I'm going through a crisis, I need help. Secondly, our lives should show that we spend time in the Word. Remember, Peter's response is exactly the same as Jesus. What does that show? That he spent time with Jesus. They notice it in verse 13, by the way. In the same way, people should know that we've spent time in the Word. The more time you spend with Jesus, you know what happens? Your language changes. You start to sound like him. You start using his words and not your own. Our language should line up. And I don't mean like using cuss words. I mean like your tone and your sensitivity and your language should change the more time you spend with the Lord. But regardless of the fact that, that you can have great delivery and, and your life could be well in line with what you're teaching, you still might face rejection. So we need to prepare to be rejected. Prepare to be rejected. Everybody has explicit and implicit reasons for rejecting ideas, thoughts, messages that they have. Megan Smith had explicit reasons for rejecting me. She rejected me because she didn't feel the same way I did. But her implicit reasons were that I looked like this. That's fifth grade Travis right there. And, and other than a manly beard and some dental work, I pretty much look the same. Now that I think about it, I've got some comb overs and some glasses going on. Same thing. But yeah. People have, you can get that off now, people are going to be totally distracted. <laughs> people have explicit and implicit reasons for rejecting you all the time. And the Sanhedrin had implicit reasons for rejecting as well. Look at, look at the first one. They rejected the messengers. Look at verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. They rejected them because they didn't like the messengers. They didn't like their boldness. We're the ruling council of Judaism. You cannot talk to us this way. They saw they were uneducated. What do you know? You're a bunch of dumb fishermen. We've been studying this for years, and we've come to the conclusion that there is no resurrection. So what you're saying is ridiculous. They didn't like them because 
they'd been with Jesus. We hate that guy. We literally killed him because we don't like him. They don't like the messengers. There are going to be people in your life that you will proclaim the gospel to that will not like what you're saying and has nothing to do with the gospel. It has to do with Christians. They don't like Christians. They don't like the church. They don't like the church because maybe they had a bad experience growing up in a church that maybe was the church's fault or maybe wasn't. Maybe it was a perceived thing. Or maybe they grew up in a family that went to church but was an absolute wreck of a family and so they just associate the two with falseness. Maybe they don't like how Christians have been the dominant force in culture in the past. And maybe they think we haven't done great things with the cultural power that we've had. I can understand that. Maybe they don't like Christians because they think we're foolish. We believe in fairy tales. You can't scientifically prove your faith, so you shouldn't have it. Or maybe they don't like Christians because they just don't like Jesus. And there are people that don't like Jesus. In any case, there's a whole lot of reasons to be rejected for Christ. As I said, one of them is that they may not like the messenger, and we need to be okay with that. We need to accept the fact that not everybody's going to like us. We're not trying to win any popularity contests. We're not certainly trying to water down the gospel. That's what the prosperity gospel is. That's what the health and wealth gospel is. It makes you feel good about yourself, but doesn't challenge you at all. And that's watering down the gospel so that you can get a big audience. And our response in face of rejection is we need to love people. Be compassionate with them. Be kind. Don't argue with them. Don't fight or conjole with them. Apologetics have their place. But if you find yourself getting heated in the middle of apologetics, you're not doing apologetics anymore. That's called an argument. And you've already lost. If you're arguing with somebody about your faith, you've already lost. And what's more is nobody's been argued into the kingdom before. And if they have been, well, I've never heard of it. Jesus himself was rejected. They didn't like his message. They didn't like him. And even tells us in John 15, you're going to be rejected just like I'm, I've been rejected. In fact, if we are followers of Jesus, shouldn't our lives look like his? And if his life was marked by rejection, shouldn't ours have some of that in it too? On account of his name? I think it should. And if not individually, perhaps as a group. So they rejected him because they didn't like the messengers. They also rejected them because they were afraid they might lose something. The Sanhedrin's in a precarious position. They've lost a lot of power to the Roman government that's ruling over them. They had to cooperate with a foreign power to get anything done, like crucifying Jesus. They had to get the Romans to work with them then, and they hated the Romans. Their religion was split into many factions. You had Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, uh, you had uh, Essenes, Herodians. You had all these different groups. They couldn't afford to lose power to another rival group. They had so much to lose. They couldn't afford to lose anything else. And they were afraid of losing two things, control and influence. Look at verse 14. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. I love that the uneducated inhabitants of Jerusalem understand that it's a sign. And they're like, how can we deny this thing? The Sadducees did not want to, the Sanhedrin didn't want to lose its control because they spoke for God. And if a miracle happened, shouldn't they be on the side of the miracle? But they couldn't say that. Why couldn't they say? Why did they want to deny so much the miracle that happened? I'll tell you why. Because they taught that the resurrection didn't exist. And if a miracle happened in the name of a man who was dead and has come back to life, then that means resurrections are real, which means, gasp, they're wrong. They're wrong. And if they're wrong, if they claim to speak for God, if you're wrong about something, can you really claim to speak for God with the kind of authority that they were claiming to have, which was unchallengeable authority? They were losing control. Most of us feel like we have very limited control of our lives. We feel like we have control through our possessions. We feel like we have control through our education, our jobs, our families. Whatever it is that we keep two hands on reality with, that's what we're, we're holding on to. But there are people that come in, groups that come in, just like the Sanhedrin had these factions that take away some of our control. Your job takes away 40, 50, 80 hours a week of your life. Then your family wants to come in and take a little bit more. And then you got some friends that are going to, you just, the church then wants stuff. And when you come home and, and you finally settle down with yourself, you're like, I've got like one hour a week to myself. And then the church comes along and is like, you need to give your life to Jesus. And I'm like, I ain't got much life left to give. 
Here's what people don't understand. They look at Jesus just like the Sanhedrin looked at him. He is a rival faction wanting to take what little last bits of my life I have. What you don't understand is Jesus is Lord. So he's over all of it. So he puts all this other stuff in perspective. He arranges this for you to make sure that it flows right. If he's at the top, then everything else sorts itself out through his wisdom and power and by following him. We're afraid to lose control. People are also afraid to lose their influence. Look at verse 17. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them. Notice this, because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. They were afraid to lose their influence. Even though they were supposed to be in control, they relied on the people to go along with the things that they said. They had influence. People in your world and in your spheres, they have influence as well, and they're afraid to lose what influence they have. Maybe it's influence in a friend group. Maybe high schoolers, students. You've got people that that, want to have certain kinds of friends, and they're willing to do certain things just to to get along with a group of friends, to have influence and that kind of power. And, And sadly enough, that doesn't always change when we grow up. Because when you get into the working world, you want to have influence with the right partners or the right associates. You want to have influence with the, with the right parts of your company. You want to have influence. And so you're willing to do things for five or ten more years. I'm just going to live this way for a little bit longer. I'm going to be as cutthroat as I can, and then I'll get established, and then I'll give my life to Christ. Then I'm willing to face rejection for his sake. Oftentimes it's political influence, right? And the church has been accused of this, particularly nowadays. Church is accused of leveraging our political influence and not being willing to face rejection over the fact that we uh, want to maintain our political influence. When you are talking to somebody about Jesus Christ, or when you want to think about talking to somebody about Jesus Christ, one of the questions you should be asking yourself is, is what do they stand to lose? Or rather, what are they afraid they're going to lose if they give their life to Christ? What are they afraid they're going to lose? What control or influence are they afraid they're going to give up? And then address that. Be like, hey, I know like, you're climbing the ladder here. I get it. But think about what you have to gain. Love, joy, peace, community. You don't have to keep striving. Address their specific needs where they're at. But remember, behind those, behind, with the underlying reasons, there's always going to be something that they're going to say to you, an explicit reason. And notice what they say to Peter. So verse 18, so they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Now, we don't have their exact quote, but look what it says. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you or rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. Basically, the Sanhedrin tells them it's not right that you do healings in this name. It's not right that you teach and preach in this name. And when you share with other people, when you put yourself out there and proclaim the name of Jesus, somebody's going to respond to you, and probably very nicely, they're going to say it's not right. They're going to say intellectually it's not right, it doesn't make sense to me, it doesn't line up. Or they're going to say it just doesn't feel right in my heart. Or it doesn't, it's, not, it's not right for me in this life right now, this lifestyle I'm in right now, it doesn't work. And either the only thing you can do in response to that is pray. If somebody is fully convinced that what they're doing is right, morally, ethically, whatever, they're not going to stop doing it. Paul was convinced he was right in persecuting the church. And you know what it took? Blinding light on the Damascus Road. That's what it took to get him to realize he was wrong. We have to pray for those people who say, I just, I just can't make that step. The Holy Spirit has to do that part. Has to do that part. But let's be honest, rejection stinks. Even if you're prepared for it, rejection is rough. It's difficult to walk through. So what do we do when we, to deal with it? Well, we've got to pray to keep going. Pray to keep going. Look at verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So they go and report back to the church. And as they're talking to the church, the church responds in prayer, in a collective prayer. And this is a great model for how we can deal with rejection, really of any kind, but particularly rejection when it comes to our faith. So the first thing they do is they remind themselves who God is. We need to remind ourselves who God is. Look at verse 24. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, 
who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of your, our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. They remind themselves that God created everything. And they remind themselves that at some point, and, 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 and it's been predicted that all the nations will be opposed uh, to Christ and to God. And, and so there's this, this sense of this isn't news to the Lord. And notice this governing body, uh, this authoritative group of people have told them they can't preach in the name of Jesus anymore. So the church comes back and says, we're going to appeal to a higher authority, the creator of the universe and our savior. And so when you're going through rejection, remind yourself who God is. Remind yourself who he is. Come back to it again and again. And make it specific to your circumstance. So if you're facing rejection by a superior, whether a teacher or, or a boss or something like that, you go and you appeal to God's sovereignty because he's in charge of all authority. But you can also appeal in other ways. Maybe it's a friend who's rejected you. Appeal to God's love, his sense of grace. Be like, God, give me love for this person. Give me forgiveness. Just like you forgave me, give me grace towards them. Remind yourself who God is. What do you have to be afraid of if God is in charge? Then you need to tell God about your circumstances. Look at verse 27. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Notice again, they bring in God's sovereignty, but he also mentions, the church mentions, all the people that were allied against Jesus Christ, and by extension, allied now against the church. There's the Roman government mentioned in Pontius Pilate. There's the local Jewish government, Herod. There's the Gentiles and the people of Israel. All the peoples, feels like, are coming down against them. And so they pray, Lord, do you see the odds that we're up against? Please help. When you are facing rejection, walk with the Lord through what's facing you, what's standing against you. Lord, I could stand to lose my job. I could stand to, to lose my group of friends. I could stand to lose my lifestyle. I could stand to lose these things. And Paul says in Colossians 1, he says he's filling up in his suffering what is lacking in Christ's affliction. Now, you might read that and think, oh, does that mean that Jesus' is suffering like buys us a little bit of salvation and then I've got to suffer more to get it? That's not what it means. What it means is that Jesus Christ is so closely identified with his church that when we suffer, he is suffering also. When we go through rejection, he is also being rejected. Bring him the disappointments, the despair that you have. Walk him through what it is that you're going through because you know what? He's going through it too. He's going through it too. He's walking with you through it. So do not sit there on it and, and, and stuff it. Talk to him about it. And then lastly, pray Pray that God would act and then look for how he's going to act. Verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. What do they ask? They ask that God would give them courage to keep speaking despite the rejection. They ask that God would continue to bring life and healing and hope through the church. They ask that Jesus Christ would be glorified and that his name would be made great. And you know what they don't ask for? They don't ask for the rejection to stop. They don't ask for the persecution to stop. They don't ask for comfort. And you know why they do this? I think it's two reasons. One, difficulty makes your faith stronger. Trial makes your faith stronger. And while I don't think we should go seek out suffering, I do think there's a part of it that we can say, you know what, it's going to make me a stronger disciple of Jesus Christ. And I think the other reason is they know that if they have the strength to proclaim the gospel, and if they continue to proclaim the gospel in the face of rejection, eventually the Holy Spirit will continue to work, and eventually these people that are rejecting them will eventually come to know the Lord. But if they're silent, no one will happen to know the Lord. And later generations will have to face that rejection. And so the church is bold, and they continue to share Christ. And you know what happens? We no longer have a ruling council telling us we can't preach the name of Jesus. Do you know why? Because the church wins. The church wins, and the church has continued to grow. And so we continue to proclaim the gospel. 
in hopes that things will change. If not for us, so that our kids and the disciples that come after us might not have to face the same rejection that we do. They'll have to face their own brand, but they can fight that battle then. We have to keep sharing. We have to keep proclaiming the name of Jesus, both explicitly with our mouths and implicitly with the way that we live. It is a non-negotiable part of being a follower of Jesus Christ, telling people about the goodness and the greatness of our God and the sacrifice of his son on the cross. And that will entail rejection. But it's a part of being a follower of Jesus Christ. So what I want us to do is I want us to pray And in the past, we've had this kind of who's your one. And we're going to talk about that again. But I want you to think about somebody in your life that you want to share Christ with or that you've thought about it or that you know needs the hope of the gospel. And I want you to think about, I want you to close our eyes. We're going to start praying for him. And I ask that that before you you, you scoot off, before you leave, I know that there's there's the the possibility of maybe grabbing grabbing some kids early or maybe going, uh, get in the garage soon. I want you to stop. This is important. Because this is an opportunity for you to pray for somebody that if they were to die right now, they would not spend an eternity with Jesus Christ. They would miss out on the gift of salvation. So the best thing you can do for them right now is to pray for them. Pray that God would peel away the layers of their heart, their their hardness, their rejection. And that there would be things in their life right now that are working, even behind the scenes, the spirit is working, to bring them to a point where the the soil of their heart isn't hard, but is fertile. And ask God to give you courage. Not forever, but to give you courage for one time, one moment, just to say the name of Jesus. Ask for an opportunity. And then to give you courage in that moment to say something like, hey, what do you think about Jesus? Jesus. Father God, you've commanded your servants. You've commanded all of creation to proclaim your glory. And trees proclaim your glory by their growth, by standing tall and by bearing fruit. And the animals of creation do it in their own way as well. But only human beings, only your people have been given voices and language to say expressly, Jesus Christ, that our God loved us so much that even though we were alienated him by evil, we were brought close to him through grace, through faith, and the death, burial, resurrection of his son. So God, I pray that you would give us courage, give us strength to face down rejection, to see it as worth the risk, and to speak boldly in the face of it. Pray that you would provide healing in the midst of rejection pray that you would give us courage to speak again. I pray that in all of it, your name will be glorified. And no matter what, we would be people who give life and healing and that living waters would flow from us. We're grateful for a God who gives us such a great responsibility. And I pray that we would look at it as a blessing and not as a curse. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray.